it's uh, great to be able to gather together and uh, worship our God on this Sabbath day and, and be together, if not physically, but, but spiritually. And we know we're in this, this time, uh, time of the uh, spring holy days. You know, we have this two times a year where we go from holy day to holy day and we have some time in between. You're, of course, nearing the end of the, the 50 days, right, between the Sabbath of the wave sheath offering and the Feast of Pentecost. And as we've been, you know, moving through these 50 days and Sabbath over Sabbath, and I'm sure in your own personal Bible study, we've been thinking about Pentecost. We've been examining the meaning. We've been looking back towards the days of unleavened bread and, of course, the rich meaning that they have. And one of the things that on, on that last day of uh, Days of Unleavened Bread that I talked about in my message was how God is creating a new creation within us and how we can look back to the Genesis story as a way to help us understand the progress that God has us go through or the progression that God has us go through. And we see that many times that God, you know, instead of just miraculously doing something, he puts us through a process. He helps us grow. He helps us um, move through this process to where we become something new. We become something else. And of course, we know that looking forward to the days, a day of Pentecost, that it pictures that time when God made his Holy Spirit available to all the the first fruits, that he, you know, on that, that first day gave it to the apostles, gave it to those that gathered with them, and that they became at that point, you know, part of that new creation, that they became a part of a body that had God actually living with them, his Holy Spirit, his power. And so if you'll turn with me today, I want to look more about this spirit world because the spirit world can help us understand what God is doing. And, and it, it ties very much into this notion of a new creation, as we'll see. So if, if, we'll, if you'll be, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2.9, we'll, we'll read what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinthians. It says here in 1 Corinthians 2.9, but as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And of course, we, we know much of what this is. We don't know everything. But it goes on and it says, But God has revealed to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Right? It's only the Spirit of God that can understand the things of God. It's, it's only His Spirit that can help us understand. And really, it's only His by His Spirit that we do understand in any depth. You know, of course, we can read the, the words and understand a little bit. But to understand to any depth, it's His Spirit that expounds it within us. And it goes on in 1 Corinthians 2.11. It says, For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And I'll, I'll just read this uh, this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.11 in the NIV. I was reading out of the New King James. And then NIV it says, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And of course, look, having us look back that it's only through his spirit that we can understand the things of God, the thoughts of God, even the words of God. And then it goes on in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So in these verses, we see that Paul talks about three different spirits. He talks about the spirit of man that knows the thoughts of man. He talks about the spirit of God, or what we commonly call the Holy Spirit, that knows the thoughts of God. And then talks about this spirit of the world, which is implied in these verses that the spirit of the world doesn't know the things or thoughts of God. That it doesn't know what God has in store, that it doesn't know the deep things of God. And then it goes on in verse 13, it says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, again, because man's wisdom cannot understand God. The spirit of man cannot understand the things that God 
has to teach us, at least the spirit of man all by itself. And it goes on, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can we know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so it implies this natural man doesn't have the Spirit of God, right? That in our natural state, without the Holy Spirit abiding with us, teaching us, guiding us, that we are this natural man and that we cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God or the things of God. So, you know, a man that does not have this Spirit of God, this Holy Spirit, cannot understand and know what these words mean, can't understand the full sense of the Word of God. So today what I want to do is I want to look at these three spirits, their characteristics and how we identify them and how they're connected. Because as we go into the Pentecost or the day of Pentecost, it helps us to understand these spirits. It helps us to understand why God had to give his Holy Spirit, the why it was important. Even at that time, that if he was going to build his church, that he was going to build this body of people that were going to Start, come to know him, come to become like him. And even as it says in Genesis, from a not just a physical perspective, become be made in the image of God, but from a spiritual perspective, be made in the image of God, it's only through this giving of the Holy Spirit that it can happen. And so the first of these spirits that I want to go and look at is what's called the spirit in man. And this spirit you know, I think is it's been talked about now and then. I It's one that I like to, to talk about because I think it's something we don't often understand. And with a clear understanding of what the spirit of man is, what it means, what it gives us, what it does, we can actually better understand God's creation of us, God, God's purpose for us, how he created us, how he intended us to be. And it also clears up several kind of uh, doctrinal issues because in this spirit of man, God makes very plain some of the more uh, hard to understand scriptures about the soul, about the spirit and things like that. So we'll read, we'll start in Job 32 verse 8. It says, but there is a spirit of man and the breath of the almighty gives him understanding. Right. And so. We see here, we saw in Corinthians that the Bible clearly states that there is a spiritual component of man, that there is a part of man that in his, by his nature, in his creation, that is part spiritual. It's, it's different than the rest of man. And we saw this in Corinthians, and there it calls it the spirit of man, this spirit that God put into all of mankind. This isn't something that's reserved for just a few. This isn't something that God gives well after birth, but this is something that when life is formed, at that very beginning, God puts it into man. And what this spirit does, it gives us understanding. You know, if you think about it, this is the difference be between mankind and animal kind, right? We, we talk about the animal spirit, right? And we understand what that means. It's, it's the spirit by which an animal understands, which is very little, right? It, it does. It feels pain. It can, you know, learn things. It can adapt. But there are certain things that just are different between animals and man. You know, both men and animals have brains. And while they're different sizes and different makeup, they're all roughly the same, right? We, we know that, you know, the ape is very close, or the chim chimpanzee are very close to man in, in how it's made up, how its body is structured, right? We both have five senses. And these senses, you know, they all enter into our brain. And in many cases, animals, of course, have much, minor, much more finely attuned senses, right? An eagle's vision, a deer's sense of smell is so much richer, so much deeper, so much better, you know, from a physical perspective than what man has. But what can an animal do with this knowledge, right? It, it gets knowledge in, right? It can, it can see very far, it can smell very sensitive things, very small things. But in reality, there's very little that it can do to reason over it. It can 
you know, look for food and then go hunting, or, you know, it can understand that it's being hunted and try to go away. But beyond that, there's not understanding, right? They only react to it. But compare that with a human, right? In some ways, as I say, has much less finely attuned senses. But what can a human do with those things, with our senses, right? We can think, we can know, we can reason, we can learn. We can make decisions, we can plan for the future. And if you look at it, this human spirit, what God is trying to tell, it imparts to the brain the, the cognitive powers to think, the cognitive power to know, to reason, to make decisions, to plan for the future. Right, and if we look, this is what God does, right? What does God do that's different than animals, right? What is kind of central to God, right? God has a plan, the plan of God, right? What these holy day seasons tell us, right? God has laid out what the future will be like. He He can see what's going to come. And in, you know, many cases, this ability to plan for the future is what drives him on, right? Which is why Christ is willing to make sacrifices, why God is willing to make sacrifices, why they're able to, or the why they're willing to be patient with us, because they know what's going to come in the future, what's going to come beyond. And if we turn to Genesis 1, we can see that this ability to think and to understand is because we were made to be like God, right? And Genesis 1 verse 26, it says, the Lord God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the seas, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So man was given dominion over all the animals. And in verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. You know, yes, there might be some implications that we physically look like what God looks spiritual looks like spiritually like we, we read in revelations what Christ is described as is described as a man but it's saying more than just that you know our minds our talents our abilities our gifts have come to us from God right they're made to be in God's image God has given to some of us these talents these abilities and of course we don't have the breadth of talents, the breadth of abilities that God has, but combined across all of man, God has given these things out. You know, we, we read in many places where God gives special talents and abilities that are beyond what a normal human would have. You know, we can think about Samson when it comes to strength. We can think of Solomon when it comes to wisdom, that these were beyond anything that a normal man would have because they came specifically to them through God, right? And so, you know, in these places, God has created us all, created each and every one of us in his likeness to have a mind, to have this ability to think, to be able to reason, to plan, to have a memory, to have a record of our lives, to have a, a spirit. Right? If we think about what a spirit is, it's, it's this, it's a, a record of our life, it's, it's, uh, you, you know, it's all of our habits, it's our character, it's all of these things that God is building in us, it's, it's this record. And, you know, where does the spirit in man come from? As I, you know, I mentioned that it, of course, came from God, but the Bible lays out clearly when it comes. So if we can read in Zechariah 12, 1, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, right? And showing that God is this creator, that God was the one that laid out, uh, that stretched out the heavens. And, and read this, this verse that he puts these three things together. And he lays them out as almost equal in magnitude in in greatness it says thus says the lord who stretches out the heavens lays the foundation of the earth and think about these things these are great things that we can't even comprehend we can't comprehend how far the heavens stretch out right it's ever growing from our understanding or lays the foundation of the earth what is the foundation of the earth you know when we think of a foundation it's something that's you know, concrete or something that's wood, something that's very stable, long lasting. But what does the earth 
what's its foundation? It's powers we don't even fully understand. It's it's gravity. It's it's how molecules hold together. How you know iron produces molten iron produces um, magnet mag a magnet. So it's all of these things that we can't fully understand. And then this third thing and forms the spirit of man within him. You know, think about that, that God says the spirit that he formed within you is of equal greatness to the foundation of the earth, is of equal greatness to stretching out of heavens. And just like these things, we don't fully understand it. Even our science can't understand what is this thing that sets man apart from animals. And so when we read this, God is saying he individually and personally formed this spirit in you. That, it, that this spirit that he put in you at your birth, at the first inkling of your consciousness, that he made it, and it is a, so great, so magnificent, that it's equal to the foundations of the, the earth and the stretching out of heavens. That's what he thinks about you as his creation and what he puts in each and every one of you, each of and every one of us, not... Something that he only gives to some of us, like the Holy Spirit, of course, he'll open it up to all. But it's something that he puts in from the very beginning. And we also see in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, it says, The dust will return to the earth as it is, talking about our bodies. That we, of course, we know from Adam that he was made of the dust of this earth. And when he died, his physical body turned back into dust. And that's what happens to each and every one of us, that... When we die, our physical bodies turn back to dust, turn back into earth. But then it goes on and it says the spirit will return to God who gave it. So two very clear things that we read here. What we read is that God is the one who gave this spirit, that it didn't come from anyone else. It didn't just happen. It didn't come from evolution or something else that God specifically gave it. And as we saw, God specifically formed it. The second thing is that when we die, the spirit returns to God. It doesn't go away. It doesn't get destroyed. It doesn't get forgotten. It goes back to God. And so think about this statement, what it implies. It says God has the spirit of every person who has died from Adam to our time today. He was the one who gave it. And when it is our time to die, it goes back to him. He keeps it. He stores it. You know, think about that. Think about how many of these spirits in man God has. Billions. And before we move on, it, it's very important to understand exactly what returns to God. Because Many, when they read this and other verses, think that it implies that there's some reference to an immortal soul. But this spirit that goes back to God is very different than the immortal soul. There's, you know, of course we know that there's no such thing as an immortal soul. Because what we have to understand is the words that are being used here. Because the Hebrew word here in, in Ecclesiastes is different than the word for soul. So when we look here in, in Ecclesiastes, what we see is this is a, a Strong's H7307, roic, which means breath or wind or spirit. And if we think about that, what did God do to Adam? Right? He breathed the breath of life into Adam. He breathed this spirit into Adam. And this is what the creation story was telling us. But when we look at soul, anywhere soul is, is, is talked about, it's Strong's H531, or H5315. Uh, it's nephesh. And this is what it means is a breathing creature. Right? It's an animal, what it says, an animal of vitality. It's something that's alive. And so if we look at God's word, we see that they're describing two distinct things. We'll, we'll read two verses here. It says in Job 34, verse 14, it says, And if he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath. Now here, his breath is 
the same as nefesh. It's using these two words, and it's very clear that we have this spirit and this breath, this spirit and this soul, that they're two different things. And in Isaiah 42, verse 5, it says, Thus says the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. So what we see here in Job 34 and 14 and Isaiah 25 or 20 or 42 and verse 5, it demonstrates that humans possess both this breath of life and the spirit of man. And it's important to understand that even with the addition of the human spirit, it is the whole physical and spiritual package that makes up the person, the soul. It's the whole person is a soul, not that the person has a soul. And this is a critical thing for us to understand and not get confused about, that neither the soul nor the human spirit retain consciousness after death, right? We, we read this in Psalms 146, verse 3 and 4. It says, Do not put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, right? It shows that, again, the spirit in man departs, that his body returns to the earth, in that very day his plans perish, which agrees with what was written in Ecclesiastes. So we see that man is not wholly physical, that God, is, or that he's not merely an animal, but like an animal, he is a living being. He has something living in him. He has that breath, that vitality, but there's something more that God created man with. There's a non-physical, a spiritual part that God has from the very beginning put into every human being, put into you, put into me. And it's this spirited man, as it's called, that allows us to be self-aware, to have intellect, be creative, have our own unique personality, our own temperament, our own character. Everything that enables humans to accomplish, or you know, that, that enables human accomplishment and knowledge, short of true spiritual understanding, is the spirit of man. And that's the key thing, that the spirit of man can help us understand everything physical, right? Everything that we can see, everything that we can, can touch, all the physical powers that are associated with this creation that God had, or God created, we, through the spirit of man, are able to understand it. And that's where we see science. That's where we understand and where we see such advancements is in all of this physical understanding. But with just the spirit of man, we can't understand the spiritual realm. We can't understand the things of God because as we saw, it's only the spirit of God that can help us understand the spiritual world, the spiritual thoughts of God. And this is where it's, it's critical to understand the dividing line. Because what it means is that we can understand everything, everything except for the spiritual world, the spiritual nature of God. And so on its, on its own, the spirit of man, though, allows man to do things that are both good and evil, right? On its own, the, if you think about the things that I talk about, or I talked about when I talk about the spirit of man, it's neither good nor bad, right? We can do both good and bad with the talents and the abilities that God give us. God gives gives us, and we see that. We see that you know, mankind apart from God can do many wondrous things, many good things, but we can also do many evil things. And so, it's it's this spirit of man you can think about is neutral. It's neither good nor evil on its own. But it has the ability, when paired with another spirit, to be either good or good and evil. And so we'll see, you know, what is this purpose of this spirit of man? In Romans 8, 15, it says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself, being the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so what we can see in verse 16 is that this spirit, 
The spirit of man, God planned to join it from the very beginning with his spirit. That he intended for the spirit of man and the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to come together. Come together as one. And when they came together, it meant that we would bring all of our talents, all of our abilities, all of our knowledge, all of our character, and it would all be for good. Because we would pair it with the understanding of God, how much God loves us, how God's way of life is for our benefit, for our betterment, for our long-term health, both spiritual, physical, and mental. Right? And so this is what the purpose of the spirit of man was from the very beginning. And you can turn back a little bit um, in Romans verse eight or Romans eight verse nine. It says, "But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, right?" And so again, Paul is laying out this process that we were physical, we were flesh, we had the spirit of man, but then we were joined together. And of course, this is what happened on that first day of Pentecost, is that man was first joined to the Spirit of God. And so now we became no longer just flesh, but spirit. And of course, we know it was just a down payment, that there's more to come, that we will eventually be turned into spirit beings. But we'll still have that spirit of man. We'll still have our own character, our own talents, our own abilities, our own character. But when we are turned into the spirit being, it's a perfect unity, a new creation, because it's now joined together perfectly with the spirit of God. And so let's now turn back, now that we've, we understand what the spirit of man is, let's turn back and look at the next two spirits, the spirit of God and the spirit of this world. Because, you know, as I say, the spirit of man, you can think about as neutral. It has as much chance in kind of the neutral state without outside influences and of course we know from the very beginning that there's outside influences when we're born but in its in its natural state in a state where nothing touches it it's neutral it's neither good nor bad it's just it's a it's a it's a whole set of talents and abilities and 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 the, and thoughts and reasons and characters but when we start looking at these next two spirits, we understand why we start to go one way or the other. So let's turn back to 1 Corinthians 3. This is right after the, the verses where we read about the, the three spirits. And I'll be reading this section from the New Living Translation because I think it makes it more clear. Here in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. And again, why could he not talk to them as spiritual people? Because they didn't have the Spirit of God. Now, this was a church of God, right? He, he makes very plain that this is the church of Corinthians. And so, it's not that they had none of the Holy Spirit, but they had, had lost that flame. They had lost so much that Paul couldn't really talk to them in spiritual terms. It says, I had to talk as though you belong to this world. And again, he's not saying that they belong to this world, but they had let that, that flame of God's Holy Spirit dim so much that it was as though he was talking to people that belong to this world, the spirit of this world. It goes on, or as though you were infants in the, in the Christian life, that they were just so immature that they didn't have this deep bond between the spirit of man and the spirit of God, that it was very dim almost like they were of the spirit of this world. And it goes on in 1 Corinthians 3, 2, it says, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready. Right? He's, he's coming back and saying, even after I fed you with milk, you're still not ready for solid food. And it's a, a message in and of itself, what the difference between milk and solid food is, because you know, I, I think we have an idea of it, but it, it's not always the complete idea. But here he, he's very plain that they're just not able to understand the deep things of the spiritual world, of spiritual nature of God. And then it goes on in verse 3. It says, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. 
right? So it starts to tie back that our sinful nature and the spirit of this world are one and the same thing. You are jealous of one another and you quarrel with each other. So it gives characteristics of being part of this world, of being almost like you're in this world or belonging to this world. It says, doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of this world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, or another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of this world? And so we see here that Paul is explaining the divisions in the church, the sins that the church Corinthians were having, came from them acting like the people of this world. And this starts to show how we identify the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is sinful. It's a sinful spirit. And again, we, we see in other places that sin is not the absence of good. It's the mixing of good and evil, right? Paul isn't saying that they did nothing right, that they have no understanding. The problem was they were mixing the spiritual understanding, the goodness of God with the sinfulness of this world. And what it ends up doing over time is it just becomes sinfulness. It just becomes a sinful nature. And this, as I said, starts to show us how to identify the spirit of this world. We'll read in, in 1 John 2.15, that's 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And again, making very clear that you're either of this world or you're of God. Your spirit of man, the spirit of man that lies within you, that dwells within you, that God himself put in there, that God fastened to be specifically for you, is either being combined with the spirit of this world or the spirit of God, God's Holy Spirit. So it goes on and it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of it. God is saying, I've already foreordained it to go away. It's not going to be here. And if you are in this world, if you're living by the spirit, or if you bound your spirit of man, the spirit of man within you, with the spirit of this world, you will pass too. You won't be part of what's to come. Right? Again, this gets us into the, the key part of whether we're going to be in God's kingdom or if we're going to be no more, passing away. And it says, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So very clear that your spirit of man is either being bound to the spirit of this world and you will pass away, or your spirit is being bound to the spirit of God and you will abide forever. You will live in his kingdom. And Paul in Romans 8, again, you see Paul repeatedly giving us this understanding and it's just bits and pieces. We have to tie it together, but it's it's critical for us to understand. And in, as I say, this Holy Day season where we're coming towards the day of Pentecost, where we see the giving of the Holy Spirit, it's critical for us to understand how these spirits work together, what the purpose of each one is, and how we understand where we stand with God whether we're binding ourselves to the spirit of this world or binding ourselves to the spirit of God. So here in Romans 8 verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh, again, talking about the spirit in the world, set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. And of course, this makes sense because we read, read before that the spirit of this world can only understand fleshly things, can only understand the things of this world. And the spirit of God is the only thing that can help us understand the things of the spirit, the thoughts of God, the nature of God, these things that we, we yearn to understand. And God is telling us plainly here how we can understand it. And there's only one way. Just completely bind our spirit, all the talents, all the abilities, all the, the character that we have, we have to bind it with God's Holy Spirit if we want to understand him more, if we want to understand him more deeply. And it goes on and it says in, in Romans 8 verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, 
right? Again, very clear that there's no in between, that there's no, you know, and it, it, we can often think of good as e good and evil as kind of a neutral state, right? A battle between good and evil. Are we we more good or are we we more evil? And and as long as we're more good, then we'll be fine. But this isn't what it's saying. It's saying that if you're bound to this world, if you're bound to this good and evil, all you have is death to look forward to. But it says, but to the spiritually minded, to those who are bound to the Holy Spirit, is life and peace. And of course, you know, in this time of uncertainty, of in this time of, of you know, the coronavirus where we are experiencing things that we've never experienced in our lifetime, we can still, if we're spiritually minded, have life and peace, right? That we know what's going to come, that we know what's going to happen. And of course, there's all kinds of physically challenging things, physically, uh, you know, things that are going to happen between now and, and when we are this spirit being. But what God is saying is if you bind to my Holy Spirit, you'll have peace through all of this. You'll have other things as we'll see. And then it goes on in verse in Romans 8, verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it. Because, of course, it can't understand the law of God. Why do I need to follow the law of God? Because I'm bound to the spirit of this world, of good and evil. Right? And we see this so much today. Why should I follow the law of God? Well, if you're spiritually minded... You won't even question why you have to follow the law of God because you'll understand why it's there. You'll understand what its purpose is, what benefits it gives you. And then here in Romans 8 verse 8, it says, So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Right? Imagine. This is, you know, what Paul is saying, very clear, very crisp things that you're either bound to the spirit of this world and if you are all you have to look forward to is death that you can't please god that you can't be a servant of god but if you're bound to the holy spirit you have life and peace to look forward to that you will be pleasing to god right and tying it back to to the creation think about what happened to god on that seventh day right if we are this new creation if we are becoming you know, being part of this creative process that God is taking us through, eventually God will have rest in his, king, in his creation. He'll have rest in you and I. He won't have to work anymore to have us become like him because we will be fully bound as the Holy Spirit and we will be mature enough that we are the ones driving to his likeness, driving to his perfection. And so from these scriptures, what we see is two important things, that the Spirit of God and the Spirit of this world are incompatible. They just cannot go together. There's no way that they can coexist, that they can't both be joined to the same thing and they can't join one another. The other one is that the Spirit of man can either join to the Spirit of God or the Spirit of this world. And this is the same idea that Paul was describing to the church of Corinthians. They were living like this world, and so they couldn't understand the things of God. But if they were bound to the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit was the one that's driving them, was, was bound to their spirit, their spirit of man, then they could understand the deep things of God. They could take hold of that solid food and chew it up and understand it, and it would nourish their bodies. But when they were babes, when they were more like the world, they couldn't do it. That even milk wasn't enough to bring them, to help them grow in to this deep things of God. And so, you know, the Spirit of God, as we read, it comes from God. It's, it's part of God himself that he emanates out. You know, we often talk about it's the power of God, right? And it's a gift that he gives as he chooses. But where does the spirit of this world come from? We'll read in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. And, and again, Corinthians is one of those books. And, and I think it's because, you know, as Paul says, the church of Corinthians 
while it was a church of God, while it was part of the body of God, it was more like the world than it was more like God. And so Paul had to explain this spiritual aspect in very clear terms that they could understand because it was important to them. It was important to them turning around, to them going back and repenting and becoming a church that God was pleased with, that becoming a church that wasn't like this world, but becoming a church that was growing to become part, fully part of the body of God. And so here we'll, we'll read in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3, it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, right? Even if people can't, can't understand it, it says it's veiled from those who are perishing. Because again, you can't understand the gospel if you don't have the Spirit of God within you. Now, you might be able to understand the words, concepts, those kind of things, but you can't really understand what God is saying, what you have to do to be part of his family. And of course, who are those, as we read before, that are perishing? It's those who don't have God's Spirit. It's those of us, you know, who, who or it's, it's people that don't have God's Spirit. All they have to look forward to is death. But of course, we know that the day of Pentecost is helping us look forward to that time, or look back to that time, we should say, I should say, where God started to give his Holy Spirit out to many people. And it goes on in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, it says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Right? So where does the spirit of this world come from? It comes from the God of this age, that he's blinded, he's put a veil. Because what he's done is he's bound his spirit with the spirit in man. And it says, Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on him. And so we see very clearly that this this spirit, the spirit of the of this age, of is comes from the God of this age. It comes from Satan, Satan the devil, and it's his spirit that he puts on us or puts in us and binds us. And of course, this is because from the very first moment we have consciousness, Satan is in there attacking us, trying to get us into a state where we will be destroyed forever. And I've talked about this this before, but you know Satan has a plan for us. It's a you know in some ways it's a similar plan to this plan of God. He wants to have children, but unlike God, where God will bring children into His family and hold out for them eternal life, this gift of eternal life, Satan wants children, but all he has in store for his children is death. Right? We we know about the ancient pagan religions where they killed their children. That's unimaginable. But the reason why is because that's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants you to become his child and then he will kill you. He's willing to sacrifice you. He wants to sacrifice you because he knows if you bind yourself to this Holy Spirit, to the Spirit of God, that you will live forever, that you'll be this new creation. And he doesn't want that. He doesn't want it for you. He doesn't want it for me. And so he will go to the very end trying to unbind us from the Spirit of God, trying to bind His Spirit in us so that all we have to look forward to is death. Right? That is what He wants. He wants for you and I. He wants for the whole world, for everyone who's ever lived. All He wants is for you to be His child and then for Him to kill you. And think about that. Now, you know, it's not always easy to think about, but it's very clear that these two, two spirits hold out very different things. Same in that they want to be, they want you to be their child, but different in the long-term outcome. And then I'll read in Ephesians 2 verse 1, it says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Right? God is saying that you were dead. You were dead because of your trespasses and sins. You were bound to the God of this age, but he made you alive. Because he broke apart that bond and he inserted his Holy Spirit there instead. And now you have life to look forward to. And it goes on, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Again, reinforcing that the spirit of this world is comes from Satan. That it's the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit. That 
there is no way that these two spirits can form together because they're at war. They're at war because one wants you to live forever and one wants you to die for all eternity. And those things can't coexist. They can't come together. So it goes on and says, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, right? That even now, Satan's spirit is working in the sons of disobedience. And of course, we know that the, right now, the sons of disobedience are greater than the sons of obedience. But it won't always be. You know, God has a plan. God has a plan where he will break Satan's hold on this world. And, you know, from what we read, not everyone will follow God's way. There will still be sons of disobedience. But we know that God has a plan where he will bring a majority of mankind into his family. That he's going to break the hold that Satan has on mankind. And he is going to be there, binding his spirit with the spirit of man. And how great will that be? Right? How much talent, how much ability is in these spirits of man that God will now bring together with his spirit and bring into his family? And it goes on, it says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. Right? We were all part of of this of the sons of disobedience we were all once bound to the spirit of this world but god and christ broke that bond bound that bound that we had that bond that we had with satan and they put a bond with this holy spirit and of course this is what pentecost is looking forward to that that this was the time where he broke that bond for those who were in his the first fruits and of course we know the the, the fall holy days picture the time where he will break that bond for all of mankind. But that is what this is talking about. This is what we have to look forward to. And it says, among uh, in, in Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Right? And so how can we identify if we're bound to the spirit of God or we're bound to the spirit of this world, you know, I think we probably all will guess it's in Galatians, right? It talks about it here in Ephesians, but Galatians is the heart of it. Galatians 5, 19, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbirths of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murder, murderers, drunkenness, revelry, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, right? He's saying, uh, you already know this, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And it's because their spirit, the spirit of man within them are bound to the spirit of this world, which only has death to look forward to. But then we see in Galatians 5, 22, it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Because when we take our spirit of man and we bind it, or God binds it with his Holy Spirit, and we let that Holy Spirit grow within us, that flame begin to burn bright and strong, these are the things that will come out of it, that we'll use our talents and our abilities, our reasons, our characters, even our character flaws that God has to work with. We'll use it for good. We'll use it for his purpose, right? And that's what God says time and time again. And so just like we see the identity that the spirit and man by our self-awareness, by our intellect, by our creativity, by having unique personalities, unique temperaments, Everything that enables human accomplishment and knowledge, you know, short is what I say, short of spiritual understanding, just like we can identify the spirit of man, that it's different than the spirit of animal, the animal spirit, we can also identify the spirit of God and the spirit of the world by their fruits, right? And it's very clear there's two sets of fruits. And by what we call the fruits of spirits, right, the fruits of the spirit of man, they're neither good nor evil. Right? We can use our talents, our abilities, can be either good or evil. It depends on which spirit we're bound to. Because the good or evil part of it comes from the spirit that we're joined to. And so, brethren, 
you know, in this time, and of course we we examined ourselves during the Passover season, examined ourselves leading up to the Days of Unleavened Bread, but I ask you again, creativity, do we use our intellect? Do we use our ability to plan for love or for selfish ambition? Do we use it for hatred or do we use it for kindness? That, you know, will help us identify where we're at on this Pentecost or as we enter this Pentecost season because our spirit of man was never designed to be alone. It won't ever be alone. It will be bound to one of these two spirits. And God, of course, from Adam, from that first man, designed God's man's spirit such that it would be joined with his Holy Spirit, allowing us to reach our full potential as sons and daughters in the very family of God. But the spirit of the world will join with us. It will if there's anything, you know, if we're not joined to the, the spirit or the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, right? Satan is willing to, you know, wanting to step right in and bind to our spirit of man as soon as we're born, as soon as we have consciousness, because that's how he is going to grow his family. And this is the problem that Paul saw with the church in Corinth, in Corinthians. And again, this was a church of God. Paul didn't deny it was a church of God, but it was a church of God that had let the Holy Spirit, the binding of the Holy Spirit with their spirit lapse, that they were so weak in their bound, bond with the Holy Spirit that they were living like the world. And so brethren, you know, as, we're, as we have examined ourselves and as we come to this day of Pentecost, let us continue to examine ourselves. Let us continue to understand where we are and what spirit we're bound to. Are we bound to the spirit of this world and look forward to death? Rebound to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and look forward to eternal life and peace.